And so, again, it is a great honor to once again present Martine Prechtel. Microphone. Big bull walrus. I like that. I have never been compared to a bull walrus. <laughs> it's quite good to come to Minneapolis and, and Minnesota to see all you guys and to be seen by you guys. And I hope that the uh, spirits make me adequate to, you know, do something good and say something good. But first things first, it's got to be the spirit, you know, before me. Because I'm just a guy that's dressed in skins, poor, wandering uh, mischief maker who somehow survived all of the attacks on things that don't want people to play and be alive. And uh, you're here because you made it too. That's good, every one of you. So I've got to make a little prayer. That's just the way we do things. And uh, not because we're in the church, but also because we're in the church. Because everybody's way is good to me, as long as it's dealing with making things live and honoring those other things that we often forget about because we're wrestling around so fast trying to eat and uh, stay ahead of that thing that wants to eat us. So let me make a little prayer. And of course, you know, you're stuck with listening to it in my tongue of Tutukil Maya. So I make this prayer now. It's for spirit. <clears throat> and you think good thought and, and it'll go right through my mouth to the other world with you. Yosin <laughs> But sorry, go I will come here and cut no ankets and now I can't hack it. Come on, I could not leave Pokla. O can not leave Pokla has a chick can make and a hack and a tally. Sakiwa, Sakime, Sakimet, Halom, Yom, Pakalom, Sakawas, Kamez, Kamez, Yom, Lamalaha, Paknel, Paknel, Shavra, and Kanatale, Elibi, Elewacha, Wakoila. She had even care of you. He called Hila, Likun, he too, Chai, go of you. Harry Kakana, She Hinkinok, and Nikah, but he knocks him, he knocks him, he knocks him, he knocks him, he knocks those of you that uh, want to repeat this phrase after me that I'm going to say, you can do it if you want to. And if you don't want to, it's all right to. Let's go. Kilab. Utsilab. Utslahbe. Utslahlo. Nimelachtak Aslimal Oshlhuch Matyushil. And this means, of course, long life, honey in the heart, white roads paved with the eyebrows of the moon, which is sea foam, yellow roads, all color roads. Which is paved with abundance. From the tail of the morning star, which is a deer. No evil. Thirteen thank yous. <laughs> yes, good. See, you just said Amen in Maya. That's Oshlahu Matishil. That means thirteen thank yous. That's how we say Amen at the end of any prayer. And people say, why do you say thirteen? 13 because Mayans are very strange like that. You know, you have a lot of this pan-Indian stuff going around nowadays. It says there's four directions or six directions. Mayans have 260 directions. They're the same. It's the same as four, same as six, same as seven. Only they're delineated. And 13 is just a way for them to say all things. Because 12 is supposed to be everything that we can see. And 13th is something uncalculated, unknown, unmeasurable, Unbuyable, unsellable, they can't be killed. So it's called the 13th. So we say 13 thank yous to me. So everything got some gratitude. So the Maya people of Guatemala, Tutuhil, those of you not uh, 
haven't been uh, afflicted with uh, my barrage of uh, wordiness in the past, I have uh, probably wondered what that is. It's Utujil. This is a small group of mine people down in Guatemala, not in Mexico. Most people think Maya, they think Yucatan, which are also Mayan peoples. But these people are from the highlands, way up the mountains. Not like Minnesota, you know, like a mountain. You know where you are in Guatemala, I said. You know, in Minnesota, you never really know where you are. Well, I never know where I am until you come and tell me. And so I know I'm in Minneapolis at the moment. It's because somebody here told me that, and I'm believing you. The airplane maybe faked me out, but I'm pretty sure I'm in Minneapolis. But in Guatemala, we've got mountains, so we can always see where, we're, where we are. And in New Mexico, it's not unlike that. Okay, so when we get up there, you know, in this mountainous land, you can see the Tutuhil people. And the Tutuhil people, there's only about 40,000 of them. When you say, well, that's a lot of Indians. Uh, in Guatemala, that's the smallest group. And the others, there's two million of, of uh, Quiches, and 800,000 Cachiqueles, and I don't know how many moms in Ishila. And Tutuhil, just a little bunch of guys down in the south side of the Lake Atitla. So all these prayers that you're hearing are sacred version of their language. And they have, as we spoke last time I was here, we have man language and we have woman language. Men and women have different languages. And then we have sacred talk and then we have this prayer talk. So we have sacred oratory. And that's what we're going to talk about tonight. Hopefully you can get to this, is the idea of, of grief and praise. The reason I want to talk about it is normally I wouldn't, in, in the village we wouldn't stand up and talk about grief and praise, being one and the same thing to us. But uh, I was noticing something the other day. And I work with a lot of people. A lot of people work with me and we come together to be together. And I was noticing that if you're going to notice the people that feel real bad about themselves when they're like middle age, you know, it's nobody praised them for something worthy when they were this tall. They may have praised them for something, but they may not have praised them for something worthy. And then I noticed those people who couldn't weep properly for the dead. And they couldn't weep properly. And when I say properly, I'm not talking about right and wrong here. I'm talking when I say properly, like really know how to do it, you know. Where you look bad when you're done. <laughs> you know? When your hair is missing and your, your clothes are ripped and you're down in the street. And I thought, why is this? Why is this? Because I noticed the people that couldn't grieve couldn't praise. Or if they did, it was very hard for them. And it wasn't their fault. I thought, what is this about this place? It's like that. What is it about this? And so I realized this thing is that when we speak of Maya, did you hear the prayer I just made? This is an ordinary prayer. Do you hear the grief in that? Right away, I bring tear to my eye. It's not an act. It's not theatrics. It's right away. Because your mortality, your mortality is in your face every time you praise realistically. Now people say, what does that mean? How does he really mean that? It's because if you are praising something, your grief, and we're not just talking about grief for the hell of it, we're talking about true grief, has to be present for the stakes to be high enough for the praise to be legitimate. Now if you're in a workplace and somebody says, that's a really nice job, chances are what they're trying to do is make sure you keep doing that job right. And not too concerned about your ancestry or your children growing up without pain. Or getting killed in the streets. But if a true praise is coming along, then it's got to contain the notion that you're mortal. And that the praiser is mortal. And that the beauty is that this moment, we're all together at this place to be together. And there's a grief in that that makes the magic of the praise very real. Because the stakes are extremely high. You see what I mean? At the same time, any grieving, what is that? Somebody dies... Or a loved one goes somewhere else. Or like myself, have your whole country ripped out beneath you. All right? And then, then what, what is that grief that you finally do? What is it? It's a form of praise of life. Because it means you miss it. You miss the damn thing. And, oh, you have to do like that. You have to be able to do like that. Because otherwise it means you don't love the thing you lost. What, what use is it? You gotta love the thing you lost. Just like you gotta love the thing you got. So that's what the thing you got, and when, you, when you're grieving for the thing you got, is praise. And when you're praising for the thing you lost, it's called grief. You understand what I'm saying? Now, unfortunately, more fortunately for us in the village, 
uh, we, we're not too, and we have our own problems. You know, we've got all kinds of other things. And one thing is we're all pretty stuck up. Like me, we all walk around like little chiefs. That's not because we think we're hot. We just figured that the spirits want us to be this way so that we appreciate the gift of being alive. The gift of being alive means you strut your stuff, not necessarily grandiosity. And if you do that, you expect to fall down trip. And then you have to laugh at yourself. But there's a praise of the spirits too. And there's a grief about the spirits. Because what's happening, hope I'm not running too deep into my esoteric thinking here, but what's happening is the spirits are also in trouble. Our spirits are in trouble. And the big, big spirits, God, if you want to call it that, we don't have that word, but we call them the owners. Not our owners, they don't own us. They each one takes care of a little thing. And they all work together like a symbiosis. It's an ecology of spirit. And your spirit is, is there too. Those spirits are hungry and they're also hurting. And they also have grief. It's very mysterious for people to think of, of gods and spirits as having grief. What do they grieve? What dies for them? Where do they go when they die? Everybody says, what? Gods die? Gods miss each other? Gods miss us? Well, where we come from, we believe that. We believe that. And so we spend in all our time, if you know me, <laughs> not much time I spend throwing jades in lakes and burning candles and, and giving uh, flour and giving this gift and that gift and giving things to people and receiving things from people. That's not because I'm trying to make myself big. That's because I'm trying to feed something that's hungry. And that feeding of hunger, that's part of praise. That's what the gods drink. That's one of the major foodstuffs of a spirit. It's praise. That's why we began right now making this talk tonight in praise of those spirit that gave us life so that we can grieve. So that we can be alive. Now I'm a little different than your normal workshop shaman that goes around country. You notice I'm using the word shaman, you say. I learned this last year, not to say shaman, see. Because people think it means shame. So we say shaman, like we're from England. We say, we say shaman, you say. And, or, or we can do it like we say shaman, and then they think you're from France. You know, <laughs> yeah. or you can say shamanka, and they think you're from Russia, which is the original word, shamanka, which means a lady shaman, because most of the shamans in Siberia are women, and some are men, and some are in-between guys. They do both kinds, you know, they're gatekeeper people, you know, that's why we don't want to put nobody down, because there's a function for everything here, nobody left out, and that, that's the main thing about grief that I couldn't figure out. I said, now why do people are running around not grieving? It's not because they're bad people. Why is praise such a, an uncool thing? Why is it so uncool to praise? And I realized it's because of trust. When there's no village, per se, then how can you trust anybody to see you in that quote unquote, what people here will call irrational state? Either one of them. Whether you're inordinately praising something, what, what I guess the Sufis would call, you know, out of your mind for God. Or you'd be praising. A lot of people, you know, they used to read the, uh, these troubadour uh, poems from France and Germany and you know, Austria and places in the Provençal. Or they used to read Sof Sufi poem out of context. They thought they were love poems to their sweethearts. And they were, because sweetheart was the spirit. They write these beautiful long things to the spirit. It's praising the spirit. And every one of those things contain grief. Every one of those things contain grief. You know, like the old Sufi poems, you know, I have to die for this love, what a bargain. If there's not grief in that, I don't know where it is. If it makes you weep for happiness, there's grief in it. They're mixed inextricably. And I was talking with uh, Mr. Tom Smith tonight, where, and, and Krista, who was jabbering around, you know, like we do. And uh, I was doing all the jabbering, actually. But... Uh, you know, as I do. And uh, <laughs> I'm sorry about that, but what can I do? They made me like this. And uh, we were talking about the village, you know, and the trust thing and all that was a, was a grieving. And I realized in the village, like, like, we're not worried about people being irrational or rational. Because we haven't got no verb to be in the language. So you can't be rational or you can't be irrational. You can't just be something like that. You're always in flux, changing around. So if you have somebody wandering down the street going, I'm Italian, 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 I'm Italian
you know, weeping eyes out, you know, falling on the ground, pulling their hair out. People don't go around and say, what's wrong with this guy? What's wrong with this lady? They go out and say, let's go listen. Let's go listen. So everybody comes around and listens. Maybe the person has taken an inebriant. Maybe they're drunk. We don't go say, oh, that's a drunk. We don't say that. We, we say that's a tear loosener. It's a tear loosener. It's medication. The only time you use alcohol is for medication. Don't use it to stay high. But then why do people drink all the time? They say, such nakbiya. Lost in liquid, they say. Lost in the grief. Lost in liquid. Anybody that drinks addicted or anything says lost in water. They're still in the water. They have to be pulled out of the water. Need, need the community. Need the village to pull out the water. The one person, they can't do it alone. So this is a culture of individualists. So you can't afford to grieve. This is nobody going to pull you out of the water. So the whole idea of grief is to make people care for each other. And that's why all the chiefs, whenever they praise, they start off with grief. The first thing they say, our grandmothers and our grandfathers died to keep this thing alive. And I have failed you with my way of going about it. But all I can offer you is your death. If we don't go down this place, the children are going to starve. So if you come with me, thank you. And if you don't, we're going to pull it for you. Don't worry. There's grief in there and there's praise in there. You're praising the people for doing what they can do. And you're being sad for the fact that it got, didn't get done right. And you're remembering the ancestors that died to carry all this thing that we know. It's all mixed in there. It's not separated. And I'm not saying everybody should all of a sudden be sad all the time. Because grief is not sadness. And it's not depression. Depression is lack of grief. It's rage. They don't want to, you know, have a home. It's what they call a homeless beast. This beast is sorrow. So the ability to laugh and the ability to weep, they live in the same house. And the Mayans say, <laughs> It means they all sleep in the same bed. That's what it means. It means they're relatives. It's not child abuse. And, and, you know, <laughs> it's not that. It's not adultery. It means they're all sibling. I mean, grief, praise, live in the same bed. Laughing and crying live in the same bed. Come from the same muscle. Come from the same muscle. So when somebody passes away with us and the tears don't loosen properly, what do we do? We search for women. We search for women who are very sensitive to life. We have professional women in our village who are known to be very sensitive to life. We search for them. And we search for men who are very sensitive to life. And they're known as professional weepers. We bring them in. We hired them. We paid them. Of course, we don't pay them in money. We paid them in, in cloth and chickens and, and uh, food for the rest of their lives. And they come in the house and they look at the situation and they get the situation explained to them, which, of course, in the village, they already know what it is. I mean, everybody knows what color your pee is before you're done peeing, you know. <laughs> in the village, you know, everybody knows what everybody's doing and, or what they think they're doing. And then you hear about that. And, uh, you know, it just creates a lot of grief, you know. And I don't have to do a lot of praise to get over it. And so that makes a lot of work for the shamans, and we like it. But, um, but this one, they do, you know. I mean, it's a good racket, you know. Make a lot of trouble, and then go fix it. It's like forest fire guys setting forest fires, and then going out and putting them out. And getting money on both sides. But shamans are well known for this. They're not holy people. They're people who are, who are in love with the sacred. They're not people who are paragons of, of virtue. They're not pedestal beings. They're a bunch of rascals. As a matter of fact, I don't even like shamans. They're pain in the ass. But, you know, I mean, you got to deal with something in this world. It's like badgers. They bite you, but they have a use. They have a use. And they also have love in them, too. And some have love in them. But when these women, especially women, men also, when they hear the situation, when they hear the situation, what happens? They eventually they start feeling and empathizing with what's going down. And then they start making these huge speeches. And then when they're done making these huge speeches, the tears start rolling. And when those tears start rolling, everybody else's tears start rolling too. You can't stop. It's natural. It's as natural as eating or speaking or seeing or tasting. So why has it become like almost like a, an unspeakable thing anymore? I don't know. Why, why did it throw away? Plus you feel so good when it's done. I don't say you feel good. You feel alive. I don't know about good is the word, maybe not the word, but alive.
Because you know the spirits, they hate anything that's too tall. So if it's too tall, it wants to knock you down. And if it's too low, it wants to buoy you up. And so if you're able to grieve, it brings you back to life. Why is that? It's because the spirits have a vested interest in keeping you alive and keeping you well. Because they need you to feed them. There's a third thing that we live for. Like here, in the modern world, and maybe in most places, they think of God and the human being. Where we come from, we've got the spirits. Some people like to call them gods. Got us and this world. And then you've got a third thing. That's not the gods, and it's not us. And that's called life. That lives beyond us, and has lived before us. We were not born at the beginning of the earth. And hopefully, our blessing is that we don't die at the end of it. That it continues beyond us. With a little bit of our beautiful smell in the air. So that somebody after us can sniff that beautiful perfume of our existence and be inspired to go on and make more beauty. Because that's what the spirits eat, is that beauty. And grief is part of that beauty. And praise is part of that beauty. So they have a vested interest in us. To keep us going so that they can keep going. Because it's a symbiotic kind of a... A negative, positive pulse that goes back and forth. And between that pulse starts a third thing. And that third thing in the middle called the heart of life, which has no power on itself except to give life, but can't keep itself going without the other two sides back and forth. So the spirits give it to us and we give it to them. 